I used to have a theory that a last minute drop goal was the best way to end a game. The sheer tension as it hangs in the air, floating towards the posts, an entire brutal physical team effort brought down to one individual's on the moment bottle and balls. I now have a new theory. A rallying comeback by the losing team who take the lead after final quarter penalty before the other side immediately gets downfield, nails a drop goal, falls back into their own half, and then hands the best long range goal kicker in the world a shot from 50 metres with seconds to play before everything culminates in a huge scrap breaking out on the final whistle is the best way to end a game. This was a match between probably the two most unpredictable sides in Test Rugby, and it predictably remained unpredictable the entire duration of the game. Things kicked off with a mad flurry of points made possible by DuPont and Pano, the French winger tearing through tackles like an angry fisherman. The execution on this try is very good by France. It's accurate, they've clearly been working on their offloading, I particularly admire Penno selflessly turning a 70% try into a 100 by offloading to DuPont rather than putting his head down and going for the corner himself. But this try is mostly about Argentina getting everything wrong. There have been a lot of, frankly, irritating think pieces about how many players were born in the country they're representing this World Cup, but despite having a 100% Argentine born and bred team, it felt like half of their defenders this weekend couldn't speak Spanish. Look at this, Fiku takes the ball in. Argentina do as they do and scramble, make the tackle, play sets up. It's fine. Only Ortega Deggio and Mojano are on the short side. France, on the other hand, have four players. Argentina have time to call for support. But they don't, and that's because, with such little space for the French players to use, there are two whole different ways that Ortega Desio and Mojano could stop the play, limiting France to just maybe some meterage, maybe even killing it dead and forcing them backwards. They could either drift out slowly and kill the space, or they could rush up and hit the first receiver and cover the first man in support. Between them, they know that there's two ways to kill this play, because Ortega Desio is thinking of the first one, and Mojano is thinking of the second one. So one defender drifts, the other shoots. This leaves one man and a bunch of space, just unmarked. There's no communication between the pair at all. This try is like war. It all could be prevented if they just talk to each other. France's other try eventually finished in the most baffling and therefore French manner ever by Gail Ficou was far more controlled and, dare, dare I say, it, intelligent. The position for the try all came from this break by Damien Peno, in a rare case of someone being right not to throw a pass on an overlap. But that break is down to far more than Peno's fast feet, so the ball comes out with the breakdown here. France are playing a very standard 1-3-3-1 structure, which basically just means they have two groups of three forwards positioned in the middle of the field, ready to smash it up and clear it out. Untermack takes the ball at first receiver, and it should be his job to just select which which of these six runners is in the best position and invite them right into the face of the Argentine defence. This is a really standard setup. Sometimes you see one group of forwards chip onto the next or a man out the back. Da, 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 da. Argentina know what to expect and they just dawdle up casually to stop it. Except instead, Untermack plays out the back to Madar, stood lateral to the second group of forwards. Madar then floats a massive spot on and frankly perfect pass that skips as many men as his fashion says has decades to unleash Peno. Because... That's what this entire play was about. The two sets of forwards and the two men at the back were just to hide Penno so Argentina don't spot him. This is essentially six or seven dummy runners. They're just making sure Argentina don't notice France's biggest threat until he's already drifted into space. It's excellent and deservedly leads to seven whole points. This became the core difference between the two teams. Argentina are frequently great throughout games, but their extended highlights usually show more bafflingly blown opportunities than the Chuckle Brothers' entire CV. This chance netted them three points, but if they'd only smartened up and again communicated, and then run the right lines with each other, they could have had a full seven, and this chance is just absurd. A fantastic clear out opens up a huge amount of space around the breakdown. All Cabelli needs to do is pop forward through the hole, or even dart himself, but instead he stutters and stumbles harder than he did in 2015 when asked what he gets up to on a night out with his girlfriend. Because uh, I don't have any girlfriend. <laughs> he also doesn't have any clue what to do here. He just lets the French defence eat him before Argentina then blow a blatant overlap in a far more common case of it being the wrong decision for someone to not pass on an overlap. This should have been a guaranteed try, and with it, a win. But as it is, the game came down to a late drop goal to seal things. Like most things in France, the genius of this drop goal is the insanity of it. Argentina have just taken the lead through this kick by Ojo and France have only been up to the 22 for moments 
Normally a team would set a few phases, get the forwards in as blockers, let the turn have a chance to steady, take their time, get things right. France don't. They just launch it right back to Lopez who strikes it well enough for it to go over just about. But this is great because none of the Argentines are expecting it. Only Cabelli spots it. The rest are probably too distracted by knowing that Yonuja is probably off hitting one of the girlfriends. However, Lopez is a left footed kicker and Cabelli is on his right side. The only man with any hope of charging him down and he has no chance. It's three points, and it's the game for France. Maybe a less French team wouldn't have let Argentina back in the game in the first place, but you probably need a team that French to smash the three points against all momentum. That may just be a theory, but this pool is wide open. There are three teams who expect to get through, and two teams capable of an upset, because this pool now boils and bubbles away slowly until October 5th when Argentina will now need to beat England to advance, whilst France will face them for likely top billing on the penultimate day of pool play. And you know what? I can't think of a better way to finish. I am in Japan at the absolute arse end of nowhere, which, you know, this is a bus stop with a sofa with holes in it that are going green. There's, there's mould actually coming off the sofa right there um so i thought this was a perfect chance to just say thank you for watching that i hope you enjoyed it um and there will be more coming up very soon not gonna lie don't entirely know which video this is gonna be you're watching it on uh but i hope you enjoyed it regardless uh, i'm working very very quickly i'm doing a roundup on the games i didn't cover um so hopefully you'll be able to enjoy that and watch that very soon um and that'll be there before too long i'm now gonna go and take this geezer to a hotel hopefully somewhere less nowhere i love it i love how this is what nowhere looks like here rather than you know looking like derby